Hello, I forgot that my mic wasn't muted. Hi. Hopefully everything looks okay. Hi, Anna. Ooh, is the cap track gonna be a problem? Am I? No, I'm not dropping frames, am I? Um, I might redo that cap chat. <laughs> it doesn't look the best. How are you, Anna? It's good to see you. Um, let's do... I don't know what all these themes are, actually. I might do the... just go back to the dark. I have no idea about anything technology, but things seem cool, and I'm good. How are you? <laughs> okay. Um, I am doing all right. Okay, let's try that. And it might... I don't like the white. Just talking about the background on the map. I want you to be able to see the map because it is a part of the story, but I also used it as a background for the capture. Also, my hair is a mess. And hopefully, um, how are the music levels? Are things, I'm gonna turn it down a little bit. Is it a little high? Oh. I think that's even worse, because it changed it to white. Ooh, story visual aid. Which is funny, because I didn't actually look at it until probably the second book. I mean, I looked at it at the beginning, but it didn't really resonate with me until later on in the story. Um, yeah, I like that even less. Music seems good, including after turning down. Okay. So, I may use the fade, I think I'm going to use the fade, and I don't know what chat, I don't know what none is, so let me try that. Okay. Oh, I think I gotta sneeze. <laughs> Sorry. Shroom is now hosting me. Thank you for the host, Shroom. I'm sorry that I do not have alerts. It's because I'm streaming on a different computer. Thank you for the bless me. That is even worse. All right, I'm going back to the original light and then I'll stop. I will stop messing with it and then I'm gonna take your word for it and I'm going to exit my own yeah so many settings and I'm not even streaming with alerts or anything like that that I would normally have okay all right I got the chat up we got my infinite pirouettes, which is really cool to see, actually. Um, oh, thank you for showing me the rules to my own stream. Okay, I think that's gonna be fine. Oh. That's weird. I put 30 seconds on that. That seems really fast. Okay, I'm sorry I keep messing with the settings, because it's going to... 
I don't know if I like the fade. Like I thought I would. Because 30, 30 seconds seems pretty fast. I'm waiting for it to go away again. Yeah. And I can... Oh, that's on the music. I was like, what in the world is that noise? Yeah, so it took me forever to... I'm gonna do like, oh! I'm gonna do like 120 seconds. <laughs> Um, light. Okay. And really, that'll be- that will be the last. And now I need to bring my chat back up. <clears throat> totes to totes. I'm totes down for a stream of messing with settings. I think you're the only one. But thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> so, I was tempted to be all. My hair is also a mess because it usually is, but it's actually okay since I dyed it and actually did stuff the other day. But it will be a mess again soon. Just a slightly red mess. Well, that's exciting. It's exciting that you dyed your hair. Okay, so, um, I'm trying to decide if I'm gonna have to blow my nose again before we start reading. Because I don't know if you want to hear me sounding like this. And sniffy. Because there I go, I'm sniffing. Totes. Z. Totes. Posted pictures in Discord. I think I did see it. I just don't think I said anything. But it looked good. It, it did look good. I don't think people on YouTube would appreciate the, set, the sniffing. Um. Okay, so music sounds okay. It's not too loud or anything against my voice. I have the the mic up pretty high. Also, blowing your nose is fine if it makes you more comfortable. <laughs> um, trying to think if I have any more announcements. Yeah, it does look good. Um, especially for doing at home, right? Oh, the computer got unplugged. And I don't want to run this on battery, so I'm going to plug that back in. Okay. Okay. I think the chat, I think that's much better. Um, Anna, so I got these out for you. Bookmarks. I need you to vote on which one you like better. <laughs> so these are like just illustrated dog. And there's a cat. There's cats on this one too. But this one's just all golden retriever puppies. <laughs> and they're very old. I've had them since childhood. I just have this whole bag of bookmarks. Oh, you know what? This has wording on the back. I'm going to read it. Goldens are easygoing and eager to please dogs. They mature physically by two years, but are not mentally mature until around three. They are good family dogs, but their boisterousness means that they should be watched around children so they don't knock them down. <laughs> Very intelligent dogs, goldens are often used as guides for the blind. How cute! So, I have bookmarks because, you know, I need book- book- ugh. This is gonna be a great stream, I can just tell. Um... I don't know why I'm smelling this. Um... This is gonna be interesting because I originally read this as an ebook. So seeing it... Is the actual print is interesting, just like the, you know, the typography and like the the interesting designs. This is already a great stream. Oh, thanks. 
Well, as usual, lots of technical difficulties since I was supposed to go to li go to live, go live two hours ago. Yeah, and it didn't happen. Um, but yeah, anyways, this is Truly Devious by Maureen Johnson. It's pretty fantastic. Um, I'm very excited about reading it. I'm not excited about my hair. Better two hours late than never, which I was originally supposed to do something with my mom tonight for a late Mother's Day thing, but she has Pilates class and uh, yeah, so that's not happening either. Um, so it almost didn't happen because I thought, oh, like when I was setting up the stream, I was like, oh, I forgot. I'm supposed to be doing stuff with my mother tonight, but that got canceled anyways, so. Um, I'm also kind of waiting around because if anybody else wants to be here, which there probably are people here, they're just um, lurking, which is totally fine. Not trying to call you out. Um, I just want to wait so that you can get, we can all start at the same place and you don't have to go back and watch the VOD and stuff. Which, by the way, for people on YouTube who are watching this later, just want to remind you all that this was originally aired as a live Twitch stream, um, which means that I am interacting with chat, and that's why I stream, so I'm not going to ignore my chat, but I will post in the description, um, oh, I need to grab paper for that, I will post a uh, timestamp for when I start each chapter. So if you want to just skip to the next chapter, you can click on the timestamp and it'll take you directly to when I start reading the next chapter. Um, waves to lurkers. <laughs> Hi lurkers, I love you all. Um, yeah, I need a piece of paper or just, I guess I can type it. I will just type it. Fancy timestamps. This is not my computer, this is Keegan's computer, so I don't, which is partially why it took me so long to set things up, because I didn't know what I'm doing. Um, opening a notepad so I can write down my I'm gonna cover my face. <laughs> Write down my time stamps. Hello, hello. I don't wanna butcher your name. Let's talk about computer. Um, blog, can I just call you blog? Is that okay? Um, okay, I think everything is good. And I'm gonna take a drink and we can get started. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> well, feel free to talk about your idea in chat. Um, but I'm gonna start reading, so I will get back with you guys when there's a break in the reading. Uh, but yeah, feel free to talk in chat amongst yourselves, and I will respond when I am able. And so, let me see where I have to start. So, for you guys who don't know, this is a series of three books. Um, there might be another one coming out. I'm not really sure. I would assume that if it's coming out, it'll be next year, and it looks like it might just be like a kind of special edition type thing, so it's really a trilogy. Um, the story takes place in, in three books. Um, and this first one was written in, it was published in 2018. The dedication page says, for anyone who has ever dreamed of finding a body in the library. And as you guys can see on the chat, there is a map. 
very detailed map of Ellingham Academy, which is where... Interesting dedication. Which is where um, our protagonist, Stevie, goes to school, and it's a private school in Vermont. Um, and I think I'm just gonna start. And I'll have to show you this. So this is what the letter, the famous letter looks like. It's like the, um, the magazine cutouts. Um, and stay tuned for danger, all my Nancy Drew fans. Um, and I'll just, I'll start reading that. But let me write down the timestamp. And we'll start around 25. Okay. The Federal Bureau of Investigation. Photographic image of letter received at the Ellingham residence on April 8th, 1936. Look, a riddle. Time for fun. Should we use a rope or gun? Knives are sharp and gleam so pretty. Poison slow, which is a pity. Fire is festive. Uh, drowning slow. Hanging's a ropey way to go. A broken head, a nasty fall, a car colliding with wall. Bombs make a very jolly noise, such ways to punish naughty boys. What shall we use? We can't decide. Just like you cannot run or hide. Ha ha. Truly devious. <laughs> April 13th, 1936, 6 p.m. You know I can't let you leave. Fate came for Dottie Epstein a year earlier in the form of a call to the principal's office. It was not her first time there. Dolores Epstein wasn't sent for any of the normal reasons, fighting, cheating, failing, absence. Dottie would get called down for more complicated matters, designing her own chemistry experiments, questioning her teacher's understanding of non-Euclidean geometry, or reading books in class because there was nothing new to be learned. So the time might as well be spent doing something useful. Dolores, the principal would say, you can't go around acting like you're smarter than everybody else. But I am, she would reply, not out of arrogance, but because it was true. This time, Dottie wasn't sure what she had done. She had broken into the library to look for a book, but she was pretty sure no one knew about that. Dottie had been in every corner of this school, had worked out every lock, and peered in all the cupboards and closets and nooks. There was no malicious intent. It was usually to find something, or just to see if it could be done. When she reached the office, Mr. Phillips, the principal, was sitting at his massive desk. There was someone else there as well, a man with salt and pepper hair and a marvelous gray suit. He sat off to the side, bathed in a striped beam of sunlight from the window blinds. He was just like someone from the movies. He actually was someone from the movies, in a way. Dolores, Mr. Phillips said, this is Mr. Albert Ellingham. Do you know who Mr. Ellingham is? Of course she did. Everyone did. Albert Ellingham owned American Steel, the New York Evening Star, and Fantastic Pictures. He was rich beyond measure. He was the kind of person you might imagining. Oh, sorry. He was the kind of person you might imagine would actually be on money. Mr. Ellingham has something wonderful to tell you. You're a very lucky girl. Come sit down, Dolores, Mr. Ellingham said, using an open hand to indicate the empty chair in front of Mr. Phillips' desk. Dottie sat, and the famous Mr. Ellingham leaned forward, resting his elbows on his knees and bringing his large, suntanned hands together in a knot. Dottie had never seen anyone with a suntan in March before. This, more than anything, was the most powerful sign of Mr. Ellingham's wealth. He could have the sun itself. I've heard a lot about you, Dolores, he said. Mr. Phillips has told me how very bright you are. Fourteen years old and in eleventh grade? You've taught yourself Latin and Greek? I understand you do translations. Dottie nodded shyly. Do you sometimes get bored here in school? He asked. 
Dottie looked at the principal nervously, but he smiled and nodded encouragement. Sometimes, Dottie said, but it's not the school's fault. Both men chuckled at this, and Dottie relaxed a little. Not much, but a little. I've started a school, Dolores, Mr. Ellingham went on. A new school where special people like you can learn at their own pace, in their own way, in whatever manner suits them. I believe learning is a game, a wonderful game. Mr. Phillips looked down at his desk blotter for a moment. Most principals probably didn't think of learning as a game, but no one would contradict the great Albert Ellingham. If he said learning was a game, it was a game. If he'd said learning was a roller skating elephant in a green dress, they would go along with that too. When you have enough power and money, you can dictate the meanings of words. I've chosen 30 students from a, uh, from a variety of backgrounds to join the school, and I'd like you to be one of them, Mr. Ellingham went on. You'll have no restrictions to your learning and access to whatever you need. Wouldn't you like that? Dottie liked that idea very much, but she saw an immediate and inescapable problem. My parents don't have any money, she said plainly. Money should never stand in the way of learning, Mr. Ellingham said kindly. My school is free. You are there as my guest, if you'll accept. It sounded too good to be real, but it was true. Albert Ellingham sent her a train ticket and fifty dollars in pocket money. A few months later, Dottie Epstein, who had never been out of New York in her life, was on her way to the mountains of Vermont and surrounded by more trees than she had ever seen. The school had a grand fountain that reminded her of the one in Central Park. The brick and stone buildings were like something from a story. Her room in Minerva House was large but cozy, with a fireplace. It was cold up here. There were books, so many fine books, and you could take out as many as you liked and read whatever you wanted, with no library finds. The teachers were kind. They had a proper science lab. They learned botany in the greenhouse. They learned dance from a woman named Madame Scotty, who ran around in a leotard and scarves and had giant bangles up and down her arms. Mr. Ellingham lived on the campus with his wife, Iris, and his three-year-old daughter, Alice. Sometimes, fancy cars came up the drive on weekends, and people in marvelous clothes stepped out. Dottie recognized at least two movie stars, a politician, and a famous singer. On those weekends, bands came in from Burlington and New York, and music came out of the Great House until all hours of the night. Sometimes, Mr. Ellingham's guest would walk around the grounds, the beads on their dresses winking in the moonlight. Even in New York, Dottie had never been so close to celebrity. The staff was careful to tidy up, but the grounds were vast and full of hiding places, so they left traces everywhere. A champagne glass here, a satin shoe there, endless crushed cigarettes, feathers, beads, and other detritus of the rich and wonderful. Dottie liked to collect these strange things she found and keep them in what she called her museum. The best thing Dottie found was a silver lighter. She flicked it on and off and was pleased by its smooth motion. She was definitely going to turn the lighter in. She just wanted to hold on to it for a while. Since Ellingham gave, it, gave its students freedom to work and study and wander, Dottie spent a lot of her time on her own. Vermont was a different sort of place. This wasn't like climbing down fire escapes or up water pipes. Dottie acclimated herself to the woods, to poking around the edges of the campus. That's how she found the tunnel on one of her first outings after she arrived at Ellingham in the fall. She was exploring the woods. Dottie had never experienced anything like this thick canopy of leaves in this deep quiet except for the occasional rustling noise. Then she heard something familiar, the sound of something thin and metal underfoot. She knew the drum-like sound immediately. It sounded exactly like the sound a sidewalk hatch made when you stepped on it. Dottie opened the hatch and saw a set of clean concrete steps leading down into the ground. She found herself in a dark brick tunnel, one that was dry and well-maintained. Her curiosity was piqued. She used the silver light to guide her down to a thick door with a sliding panel at eye level. 
She knew this sort of thing at once. They were all over the city. It was a speakeasy door. The door was unlocked. Nothing about this tunnel seemed very secure. It was just there to be explored. So she explored. The door opened to a room about eight foot square with a high ceiling. The walls were covered in shelving, and those shelves were full of bottles of wine and liquor of every description. Dottie examined the ornate labels on the colored glass. Labels in French, German, Russian, Spanish, Greek, an entire library of alcohol. There was a ladder built into one wall. Dottie climbed it and opened the hatch at the top. She found herself inside a small domed structure with a glass roof. The floor was covered in fur rugs and cushions, several ashtrays, and a few errant champagne glasses. She stood on the bench seating that ran around the rim of the room and realized she was on a small island in the middle of the ornamental lake behind the Ellingham Great House. A secret nook! The most perfect secret nook in all the world. This would be her reading spot, she decided. Dottie Epstein spent a lot of her time there, curled up in a fur rug, a pile of books by her side. No one had ever caught her there, and she felt sure that even if Mr. Ellingham did, he wouldn't mind. He was such a kind man and so full of fun. Nothing could be safer. That particular April day was strange and foggy, blurring spaces between the trees and blanketing all of Ellingham in a mist milky mist. Dottie decided that the weather lent itself to a mystery. Sherlock Holmes would be perfect. She'd read every Sherlock Holmes story, but rereading was one of her greatest pleasures, and this fog was just like the London fog in the stories. She had learned which times were best to go to the Little Dome. It was a Monday afternoon. No one from the big house would be there. Mr. Ellingham had driven off that morning, and Mrs. Ellingham in the afternoon. Dottie took the collection of Sherlock Holmes stories from the school library and set out for her secret place. The view from inside the little glass dome that day was like being inside of a cloud. Dottie stretched out on the floor, pulled the fur rug over her, and opened the book. Soon she was lost on the streets of London. The game was afoot! Dottie got so lost in her reading that she was taken unawares by a noise directly below her. Someone was in the liquor room and was climbing up the stairs. Someone was right there. With no time to get away, Dottie pulled the heavy fur rug over herself and pressed herself as far against the wall as possible and tried to mix in with a pile of cushions. Just stay on the floor, be a lump. She heard the groan of the hatch being lifted, the thunk as it fell back against the stone. The person hoisted themselves into the dome and stood just a foot or so away from Dottie's face. She prayed they didn't step on her. She pulled herself in tighter. The person moved away from her and set something down on the floor. Dottie took a chance and lifted the edge of the rug by just an inch and saw a gloved hand pulling items from a sack and setting them on the floor. She chanced another inch to get a better look. There was a flashlight, binoculars, a length of rope, and something that glinted. The glinting thing was handcuffs, sort of like the ones her uncle the police officer had. A flashlight, binoculars, rope, and handcuffs? A flush of adrenaline ran through her body, skyrocketing her heart rate. Something was wrong here. She let the rug drop over her face and hunkered down tight, her face pressed into the floor, flattening the bridge of her nose. The person shuffled around the space for several minutes. Then, there was a sudden quiet. Had they gone? She would have heard someone leave down the hatch by her head. Her breath came back hot against her face. She had no idea what was happening, but her, it made her head light. She began to count in her head. When she reached 500 and there was still no noise, she made the decision to slowly lift the edge of the rug again. Just a finger width. Just a touch more. No one was there in her line of sight. She inched it up a bit more. Nothing. She was about to lift it when... Hello? said a voice. Dottie felt her heart pressing into the floor. Don't be afraid, the voice said. You can come out. There was no point in hiding now. Dottie crawled out from under the blanket, clutching her book. She looked at the visitor and then at the objects on the floor. 
Those are for the game, the person said. Game? Of course. The Ellinghams loved games. They were always playing them with guests. Elaborate treasure hunts and puzzles. Mr. Ellingham had f filled the student houses with board games like Monopoly, and sometimes he even came down to play. Flashlight, rope, binoculars, handcuffs. It could be a game. Monopoly had strange pieces, too. What kind of game? Dottie said. Oh, it's, it's very complicated, the person said. But it's going to be a lot of fun. I have to hide. You were hiding in here, too? To read, Dottie said. She held up the book and tried to keep her hands from shaking. Sherlock Holmes? said the person. I love Sherlock Holmes. Which story are you reading? A Study in Scarlet. That's a good one. Go ahead, read. Don't let me stop you. The visitor got out a cigarette and lit it, then smoked it while watching her. Dottie had seen this person before. This was someone who might very well have been playing one of the Ellingham's elaborate games. But Dottie was also a New York girl who had seen enough to know when something was off. The look in the eye. The tone in the voice. Her uncle, the cop, always said to her, Trust your instincts, Dottie. If you have a bad feeling about something or someone, you get out of there. You go and you get me. Dottie's instincts told her to get out, but carefully. Act normal. She opened her book and tried to focus on the words in front of her. She always kept a bit of pencil up her sleeve for taking notes. When the visitor looked away and out the glass, she pushed the pencil down and into her palm, a move she had perfected over time, and roughly drew a line under a sentence on the page. It wasn't much, but it was a way of take making a note that maybe some someone would understand if... No one would understand, and if was too terrifying to think of. She shoved the pencil back into her sleeve. She couldn't pretend to read anymore. Her eyes couldn't track the words. Everything in her shook. I need to get get this back to the library, she said. I won't tell anyone you're here. I hate it when people tell on me. The person smiled at her, but it was a strange smile. Not sincere. Pulled too far at the corners of the mouth. Dottie became acutely aware that she was in a structure in the middle of a lake, halfway up a mountain. She ran all possible scenarios in her head and could see how the next few seconds were going to play out. Her heart slowed and the sound of its beating thudded in her head. Time was going very slowly. She had read many stories in which death was present as a character, a palpable force in the room. There was such a force in the room now, a silent visitor in the space. I have to go, she said, her voice thick. She started to move toward the hatch, and the person moved that way as well. They were like players on a chessboard, working things out to an inevitable end. You know I can't let you leave, the person said. I wish I could. You can, Dottie said. I'm good at keeping secrets. She clutched her Sh Sherlock Holmes. Nothing, could bad Nothing bad could happen when she was holding Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock would save her. Please, she said. I'm so sorry, the visitor said, with what sounded like genuine sadness. There was exactly one move left in the game, and Dottie knew it was a bad one. But when you have no spaces left on the board, you do what you have to do. She lunged for the hatch opening. There was no time to try to get onto the ladder. She dropped the book and leaped into the dark hole. She reached out blindly. Her fingers slipped along the rungs of the ladder, but she couldn't get purchase. She was falling. The floor met her with a terrible finality. She had a pulsing moment of consciousness when she landed. There was an ache that was almost sweet, and something warm pulled around her. The person was coming down the ladder. She tried to move to slide along the floor, but there was no use. I wish you hadn't come here, the visitor said. I really do. When the darkness came for Dottie, it was quick and it was total. Excerpt from Murders on the Mountain, The Ellingham Affair Ellingham Academy was located halfway up a mountain officially named Mount Morgan. No one called it Mount Morgan, though. 
It was always n lo it was always known locally as Mount Hatchet or the Big Axe because of the protuberance at the peak, which resembled the tools of the same names. Unlike the mountains around it, which attracted skiers and vacationers, Mount Hatchet was largely undeveloped and wooded. Hikers liked it, and so did loners and birdwatchers and people who enjoyed mountain streams and getting lost in the woods. In 1928, when Albert Ellingham came upon it, people avoided the Big Axe. No roads, no matter how rough, went that way. The woods were too thick, the river too deep. There were too many falling rocks, it was too wild and strange. According to the legend, Albert Ellingham had come to the place purely by mistake while trying to get to Burlington to the yacht club. How you accidentally found yourself up the side of an uninhabited mountain in 1928 is unclear, but he had done it and proclaimed the spot perfect. He had long had a dream of establishing a school that employed his own principles and ideals. Learning as a game, a blend of rich and poor students, everyone learning together at their own pace. The air here was clean, the birdsong pure. There was nothing to distract students from their purpose. Ellingham purchased a mass massive plot at three times the asking price. It took a few years to dynamite enough flat space to build the school. Rough roads were cut. The telephone company ran wires and put in a few payphones along the way. Slowly but surely, Mount Hatchet was connected to the world by a dirt track and a few wires and a stream of people and supplies. Ellingham Academy, as it would be known, was ju not just going to be a school. The Ellinghams also built a home there, smack in the heart of the campus. And it wasn't just any home, either. It was the grandest home in all of Vermont, as large as the largest buildings in Burlington or Mont... 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 Pellier? Montpelier? I don't know, it's in Vermont. Um, Montpelier, we'll go with that. Albert Ellingham wanted to live in his, in his experiment, in his seat of learning. The grounds were full of statuary. The property was crisscrossed with pathways that made no real sense. The rumor was that Ellingham followed one of his cats, and had a stone path made along any route it preferred to take because he felt cats know best. The rumor wasn't true, but Ellingham enjoyed it so much that there was another rumor that he started the rumor there was another rumor that he started the first rumor himself. Then there were the tunnels, the fake windows, the doors to nowhere. All the little architectural jokes that amused Albert Ellingham to no end and made his parties infamously entertaining. It was said that even he didn't know the location of every tunnel or space. He didn't know the look. Oh, sorry. And that he had allowed the various architects to put a few in as pleasant surprises. It was, in short, idyllic and fantastical, and may have remained as such had it not been for that foggy night in April 1936 when truly devious struck. Schools may be famous for many things, academics, graduates, sports teams. They are not supposed to be famous for murders. Okay, that was, that was the very first section. Starts out very mysteriously. Montpellier. It's French. Actually, don't say the T on the end of Montpellier. Pellier. Montpellier. Depending on how French you want to be. Well, how do people actually say it? How do people actually say it who live there? Welcome for joining, CJ. Okay, let's see blogs, um, computer idea. I have a dream about, say you, you're you about to die, you have cancer, but you use your brain, uploading your brain to a computer, but you're inside a computer, but you get to live forever, or you get a choice to be dead or live inside a computer. I mean, that sounds like what they did in The Winter Soldier, the movie when they put Zola, Zola, Zola's brain inside a computer. I listen. Yay for lots of books. Sharp knife hype. I knew you would like that, Anna. Page voice is comforting. Oh, I'm glad. 
Secret Nook reading spots are amazing. Poor Dot. I know. That's very sad. I didn't think the Vermont version was pronounced in a French way. I have only heard Montpelier. Pelier. Montpelier. I don't really know. I don't live near there, and I've mostly just heard my family say it, and they do the French way. I'll probably say it Montpelier, but at the same time, I don't think it's that important in the book, so it probably won't come up for a while if it does at all. How Sorry, how's your day going, CJ? I am glad you're here. Thank you for being here. Um Forgot what I was going to say. Oh, are you guys drinking anything? Do you have any tea? Or coffee or anything cozy. It's been okay. And I just ordered some food, trying not to feel guilty about how expensive it was. Don't feel guilty. Um, this will make you feel better. I think our average of ordering out has been like five days. Every five days we order out. So don't feel bad. Because <laughs> that includes, you know, like a fee, tax, and a tip. So don't worry and you're just feeding yourself like we're feeding two people and then we order we usually order like a little bit like we'll get an appetizer or something um to have lots of leftovers hey joni good to see you how are you i just made more coffee nice is it just how do you like your coffee anna do you like it black do you put um any kind of fancy creamer in or anything like that Thank you, because I always feel bad about everything. I know what you mean, CJ. I I feel bad about it too sometimes, but you're treating yourself, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and you deserve it. Yes, welcome for jo joining, Joni. Oh, also, for those who may have not seen it, um, I have some bookmarks here, and if you want to vote on which one I use... They're golden retrievers, and then they're illustrated dogs and cats. I like it with sugar and half and half, and I usually have either vanilla or hazelnut flavored coffee. That sounds good. That sounds really good. I don't have anything cool to drink. I should get some PBW. Ooh, that sounds good. If you get PB PBW, let me know which uh, flavor you get. Um, right now I'm just drinking water. If I take a break or anything, I might get some tea. Dogs and cats. Okay, we have one vote for dogs and cats. I vote the one that includes cats to honor Boo. Although you could use, also use both. True. Okay. Alright, well. I'm gonna get on, so this... So we read the first part, and now we're going to delve into chapter one. And my face is twitching. <laughs> so, chapter one. The moose is a lie. Oh, I don't know what voices I'm going to do. For Stevie, let's see. The moose is a lie, Stevie Bell said. Her mother turned to her, looking like she often looked, a bit tired, forced to engage in whatever Stevie was about to say, at a parental obligation. What? She said. Stevie pointed out of the window of the coach. See that? Stevie indicated a sign that simply read, Moose. We passed five of those. That's a lot of promises. Not one moose. But Stevie's not this dramatic, I feel like. <laughs> I don't know what voices to do. Stevie, they also promised falling rocks. Where are my falling rocks? Stevie, I'm a strong believer in truth and advertising, Stevie said. This resulted in a long pause. Stevie and her parents had had many conversations about the nature of truth and fact, and this might, on another day, have erupted into an argument. Not today. They seemed to decide 
through some mutual and unspoken agreement that they would let the matter slide along. It wasn't every day he moved away from home to go to boarding school, after all. <clears throat> I don't like that we're not allowed to drive up to the campus, her father said, for what was probably the eighth time that morning. Ellingham's information packet had been very clear on this point. Do not attempt to drive students to the school. You will be forced to leave them at the roadside gate. No exceptions will be made. There was nothing nefarious in this. The reason was well explained. The campus had not been designed for lots of cars. There was only a single road in, and there was no place to park. To get in or out, you rode in the Ellingham coach. Her parents had viewed this dimly, as if a place hard to reach by car was somehow inherently suspicious, and impinged on their God-given American freedom to drive anywhere they wanted to. Rules were rules, though, so the Bells were seated in this coach. A quality one, with a dozen seats, tinted windows, and a video screen that did nothing but faintly mirror the window reflection back again. An older, silver-haired man was at the wheel. He had not spoken since he had picked them up at the rest stop 15 minutes before, and even then all he said was, Stephanie Bell? And, sit where you want, no one else in there. Stevie had heard about this famous Vermont reticence, and that they called outsiders flatlanders, but there was something spooky about his silence. Look, her mom said quietly, if you change your mind... Stevie gripped the side of her seat. I'm not going to change my mind. We're here. Almost. I'm just saying, her mother said, and then she stopped saying it. This was another well-trod conversation. The morning was full of greatest hits and little new material. Stevie looked back out at the, as the view of the mystically blue Vermont skyline disappeared, eaten by the trees and the walls of sheer rock where the road cut through the mountains. Her ears popped from the slow increase in altitude as they drove along I-89, away from Burlington, Vermont, and deeper into the wild. Sensing that the conversation had come to its natural end, she put in her earbuds. Her mom touched her arm as she went to hit play on her podcast. Maybe this isn't the time to be listening to those creepy murder stories, she said. True crime, Stevie replied before she could stop herself. Making the correction made her sound pedantic. Also, no fighting, no fighting. Stevie pulled out the earbud jack and coiled the cord. Have you heard from your friend? Her mom said. Giselle? Janelle, Stevie corrected her. She texted and said she was on her way to the airport. That's good, her mom said. It will be good for you to have some friends. Be nice, Stevie. Don't say you already have friends. You have lots of friends. It doesn't matter that a lot of them are people you know online from murder mystery boards. Her parents had no idea that you could meet people outside of school, and it wasn't freaky, and the internet was the way of finding your people. So true. And of course, she had friends at school too, but never in the way she was supposed to, which apparently involved pajama parties and makeup and going to the mall. That didn't matter now. The future was here, up in the misty mountains. So Janelle is interested in what again? Her mother asked. Engineering, Stevie said. She makes things, machines, devices. A skeptical silence followed. And that Nate boy is a writer? Her mother said. The Nate boy is a writer, Stevie confirmed. These were the two other first years known to live in Stevie's new dorm. They didn't tell you about the second years. Again, this was information that had circulated around the Bell kitchen table for weeks. Janelle Franklin was from Chicago. She was a, natural, a national student spokesperson for Growing STEMS, a program that encouraged young girls of color to enter the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Stevie had gotten a lot of background, how Janelle had been caught, successfully, repairing the toaster oven when she was six years old. Stevie knew all of Janelle's likes, making machines and gadgets, soldering and welding, curating her Pinterest boards of organizational techniques, girls with glasses, YA novels, coffee, cats, and pretty much any television show. Stevie and Janelle were already in regular text communication, so that was good. Friend one. The other first year in Minerva was Nate Fisher. 
Nate said less and never replied to texts, but there was more to know about him. Nate published a book called The Moon Bright Cycles when he was 14. 700 pages of epic fantasy written over the course of a few months, first published online and then in book form. Moonbright Book 2 was supposedly in the works. They were the kind of people Ellingham Academy accepted. They sound like very impressive people, her dad said. And you are too. We're proud. You know that. Stevie read the code in this sentence. Much as we love you, we have no idea why you have been accepted into this school, strange child of ours. The entire summer had been like this, this weird mix of voiced pride and unvoiced doubt, underpinned by confusion about how this series of events had happened at all. When she had first done it, Stevie's parents didn't know she had applied to Ellingham at all. Ellingham Academy wasn't the kind of place people like the Bells went to. For almost a century, the school had been home to creative geniuses, radical thinkers, and innovators. Ellingham had no application, no list of requirements, no instructions other than, if you would like to be considered for Ellingham Academy, please get in touch. That was it. One simple sentence that drove every high-flying student frantic. What did they want? What were they looking for? This was like a riddle from a fantasy story or fairy tale. Something the wizard makes you do before you are allowed into the Cave of Secrets. Applications were supposed to be rigid lists of requirements and test scores and essays and recommendations and maybe a blood sample and a few bars from a popular musical. Not Ellingham. Just knock on the door. Just knock on the door in the special, correct way they would not describe. You just had to get in touch with something. They looked for a spark. If they saw such a spark in you, you could be one of the 50 students they took each year. The program was only two years long, just the junior and senior years of high school. There were no tuition fees. If you got in, it was free. You just had to get in. The coach veered into the exit lane and pulled into another rest stop where one family, one other family stood in wait. A girl and her parents studied their phones. The girl was extremely petite with dark long hair. She has nice hair, Stevie's mo mom said. Though she was talking about someone else, this was a reference to Stevie's hair, which Stevie had cut off herself in the bathroom in the early spring in a burst of self-renewal. Her mother had cried when she saw Stevie's blonde hair in the sink and had taken her to a hairdresser to get it trimmed and shaped. The hair had been a major point of contention, so much so that at one point her parents said she would not be allowed to go to Ellingham as a punishment. But they backed down in the end. The threat had been made in high emotion. Her mother had been very attached to Stevie's hair, with, which on some level was why it had to go. Mostly though, Stevie just thought it would look better short. It did. The pixie cut suited her, and it was easy to care for. There were problems when she dyed it pink and blue, and pink and blue, but now it was back to normal, dusty blonde and short. The girls' bags were loaded into the bottom of the coach, and she and her family got in. The three of them were all dark-haired and studious-looking, with large eyes framed by glasses. It looked like a family of owls. Polite, mumbled hellos were exchanged, and the girl and her family took their seats behind the bells. Stevie recognized the girl from the first-year guide, but didn't remember her name. Her mom gave her a nudge, which Stevie tried to ignore. The girl was again looking at her phone. Stevie. Stevie took a long breath through her nose. This was going to require leaning over her mom and calling out to the girl who was a row behind on the opposite side. Awkward. But she was going to have to do it. Hey, Stevie said. The girl looked up. Hey, she said. I'm Stevie Bell. The girl blinked slowly, logging this information. Jermaine Bat, she said. Nothing else was offered. Stevie started to lean back, feeling like this had been a good enough effort all around, but her mom nudged her again. Make friends, she whispered. Few words are more chilling when put together than make friends. The command to pair bond sent ice through... The command to pair... What? The command to pair bond sent ice water through Stevie's veins. She wanted falling rocks. But she knew what would happen if she didn't do the talking. Her parents would. And if her parents started, 
Anything could happen. Did you come far? Stevie asked. No, Tremaine said, looking up from her phone. We came from Pittsburgh. We came from Pittsburgh. Oh, Tremaine said. Stevie leaned back, looked at her mom, and shrugged. She couldn't make Tremaine talk. Her mom gave her a well-you-tried look. Points for effort. The coach juddered as it turned off the highway onto a rockier, smaller road dotted with stores and farms and signs for skiing, glass blowing, and maple syrup candy. Then there were fewer buildings and more stretches of farmland with nothing but old red trucks and the occasional horse. Up and up into the woods. Out of nowhere, the coach made a sharp turn into an opening in the trees, jerking Stevie to the side and almost tipping her out of her seat. Close to the ground, there was a small maroon sign with gold letters, the Ellingham Academy entrance. It was so inconspicuous that it seemed like the school was deliberately hiding. The road they were now on was barely a road. It would be charitable to call it a path. What it was, in reality, was an artificial tear in the landscape, a meandering scar in the forest. At first, it went down, very fast, pitching toward one of the streams that bounded the property. At the base, there was a construction that you could laughingly refer to as a bridge that appeared to be made of wood, rope, and dreams. The sides were about a foot high, and it looked like it would collapse if anything heavier than a steak dinner crossed it. The coach barreled over it. The bridge shook violently, rumbling, rumbling Stevie's seat. They went up again, had a gradient usually reserved for ski lifts and airplane takeoffs. Nothing would stop the coach. The shade from the trees darkened the path completely. The branches scratched at the sides of the vehicle like dozens of fingernails. The coach made grinding noises and seemed to be fighting its way up the ever-narrowing path. Stevie knew there was nothing to be afraid of, but the coach seemed to be working against the forces of the universe itself to make its way up this driveway. It was unlikely that this would be the trip, this one with her and her parents, that the coach would give way and barrel backward the way it had come, running loose and wild, crashing blindly toward the river in sweet, cold, watery, watery oblivion. But you never knew. The ground started to level, and trees gave way to a smoother path and an opening view of green lawns. The coach approached a gate guarded by two statues on pedestals, winged creatures with smiling faces and empty eyes, four paws and tails. Those are strange angels, her mother said, craning to look. They're not angels, Stevie said. They're sphinxes. They're mythical creatures that you that ask you riddles before you allowed, you're allowed to enter a place. If you get it wrong, they eat you. Like from Oedipus. The riddle of the sphinx. That's a sphinx. Not to be com confused with Spanx, which is a sidearm in the holster of the diet industrial complex. Her mother gave her that look again. We kind of wanted the going out shopping prom going type and we got this weird creepy one. And we love it, but what is it talking about, ever? Sometimes Stevie felt bad for her parents. Their idea of what const constituted interesting was so limited. They were never going to have as much fun as she did. Germaine peered over at Stevie with large, luminous eyes. Her expression was as unreadable as the Sphinx's. In that moment, a blanket of doubt dropped over everything in Stevie's mind. She should not have been admitted. The letter came to the wrong house, the wrong Stevie. It was a trick, a joke, a cosmic mistake. None of this could be real. But it was too late, even if all of those things were true, because they had arrived at Ellingham Academy. End of chapter one. Hi, Angel. Good to see you. Pop in and let you know I'm here, just lurking while I do some schoolwork. Okay. Good luck with the schoolwork. Do your best. Chapter one had Moon Lake vibes. Yeah. Yeah, it, there are definitely things that remind me of Nancy Drew about this. Um, I like, let's see, don't have anything cool to drink. Oh, thank you for clapping. Welcome for clapping. Hmm. Welcome for having a warm can of P PBW. Way to call out the fam book. 
I am always baffled by parents' attachment to their kids' hair. That's why I never dyed my hair for years until I was an adult living on my own because of my parents' attachment to my hair. I get it for like baby's first haircut moments, but at some point you have to respect that your kid is an independent person. If they're going off to, is this school a college? No, it's, it's a private high school for juniors and seniors. That's probably a good time. By the way, I liked your dyed hair, Anna. I kept wanting to say that. It reminded me of something nice, but I couldn't figure out what I'm thinking of, so I give up. But thank you for clapping. Welcome for clapping for chapter one. Ooh. That sounds awesome, Joni. I haven't done a, a jigsaw in a long time. What kind of... How many pieces and what's the jigsaw of... Or what's the picture? I love puzzles, too. <clears throat> I feel like I can't get my voice to go very deep. And I don't know why that is. Like, I can't modulate my pitch very much right now. And I don't know why. So I think I feel like that's affecting my reading. And I'm sorry if it is. I'm trying to drink water, but I don't think it's helping. <clears throat> you know what? I am hungry. <laughs> um, can you guys tell me if the um, small one, 550 and a picture of a wolf. Ooh, that sounds nice. Um, I had wolves on some bookmarks, too. <laughs> um, what was I gonna say? Can you guys tell me how the volume levels are? Um, does it sound okay? Do you think anything needs to be adjusted? We used to go camping during the summers when I was a kid, and we would set up a table by the fire and do a jigsaw puzzle, which of course was my favorite thing. Oh, that sounds awesome. I have never been camping, but I also, everything is good. Okay, thank you guys. Um, I, I don't want to go camping. I'm just not that kind of person, I guess. Volume is fine for me. Okay, thank you guys. Appreciate it. <clears throat> I guess my lighting is just like automatically adjusting. I, I don't know what's happening. I tried to use this green uh, wall as like a green screen, but I don't think it's gonna work. Unless I just didn't know how to fix my settings, which is also possible, but. Um, okay. Well, I think we should, um, I went camping once, it was not for me. <laughs> yeah. I, I would not be able to sleep because I'd be anxious about everything. I'd be anxious about bugs and animals. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's good for my anxiety, <laughs> to say the least. I'm going to switch ears. It's my left ear is starting to hurt. Never been camping, I don't think I would like it. I'm glad I'm not alone. <laughs> Because I feel like lots of people that I know uh, love camping, and I'm just like, I'm just not interested. Okay. Okay, shall we continue? Chapter two. The first thing Stevie saw was the circular green with a fountain in the middle, a statue of Neptune standing and greeting in the splashing water. A thick curtain of trees surrounded the green. Bits of buildings, flashes of brick and stone and glass peeped shyly in the gaps. At the very top of the green, the host of the whole affair, was a great mansion. A great house. A mad gothic manor with dozens of cathedral windows, four arches around the door, and a multi-peaked roof. 
Stevie was rendered near speechless for a minute. She had seen hundreds of photographs of the Ellingham estate. She knew the maps and the angles and the views, but being here in the fresh, thin air, hearing the splash from the Neptune fountain, feeling the sun on her face as she stood on the great lawn, being, her, being here gave her a head rush. The driver unloaded Stevie's suitcases from the belly of the coach, along with the three bags of groceries her parents had insisted her bringing. They were embarrassingly heavy, packed with jumbo plastic containers of peanut butter, powdered iced tea, and lots of shower gel and sanitary products, and other things bought on sale. Are we supposed to tip him? Her mother said quietly as all of this was unloaded from the coach. No, Stevie said, forcing confidence into her voice. She had no idea if you tipped the school coach driver or not. This had not come up in her research. You okay? Her dad asked. Yep, she said, steadying herself against her suitcase. It's just so beautiful. It's something, he said. No denying that. A large golf cart circled the drive and pulled up alongside them. Another man greeted them. He was younger than the driver, in his 30s maybe. Rugged and muscular and dressed in well-worn cargo shirt, shorts and an Ellingham polo shirt. He was the kind of clean-cut person who made her parents relax, and therefore Stevie relaxed. Stephanie Bell? he asked. Stevie, she corrected him. I'm Mark Parsons, he said, head of grounds. You got Minerva. Nice house. Stevie's things and the Bells themselves were loaded on into the cart. Jermaine and her family were put in another and sent off in the opposite direction. Everyone wants Minerva, Mark added when they were out of earshot. It's the best house. The property was full of smooth, twisting stone paths between copses of trees. They rode along under the heavy shade, and Stevie and her parents were cowed into impressed silence by the school buildings. There were some large, grand ones of stone and red brick with gothic arches connecting them, and tiny turrets softening their corners. Some were bare and grand, while others were wrapped so tightly in ivy it looked like they were being presented as gifts to some forest god. This wasn't her local high school. This was clearly a seat of learning. There were Greek and Roman statues of cold white stone behind the trees, standing alone in the clearings. Someone's been to the garden center, her dad said. Oh no, Mark replied, steering the cart past a chorus of heads, their eyes blank and empty but their expressions determined, looking very much like some committee in the middle of an important decision. These are all the real thing. A fortune's worth of statues out in the open. They, there were, to be fair, maybe too many statues. Someone should ha have had a talk with Albert Ellingham and told him to maybe relax with the statue buying. But if you're rich enough and famous enough, Stevie figured, you can do pretty much anything you want with your mountaintop lair. The golf cart stopped in front of a low, dignified house built in alternating red and gold brick. It seemed to be in several parts. There was a large section on the right that looked like a normal house, then a long extension off to the side that ended in a turret. The entire structure was covered in a coat of Virginia creeper that obscured the bass relief faces that peered from the roof line and from above the windows. The door was bright blue and hanging open, letting in the breeze and the flies. Stevie and her parents stepped into what appeared to be some kind of common room, with a stone floor and a wide fireplace surrounded by rocking chairs. The room was cool and shaded and still smelled of wood and past fires. It was decorated in a slightly claustrophobic red flocked, wall, red flocked wallpaper and a mounted moose head that wore a crown of decorative lights. There was a hammock chair hanging by the fire, lots of floor cushions, a beat-up but exceedingly comfortable-looking purple sofa, and a massive farm table that took up most of the room. On the farm table was a tackle box and some small items that looked like craft supplies, beads, or the many mysterious things involved in the scrapbooking process. Right by the door, eight large pegs protruded from the wall. These were maybe nine or ten inches long, far too large for coats. Stevie touched one with the tip of her finger as a physical manifestation of the question, What are you? Hello! Stevie turned to see a woman coming out of the small kitchen area with a mug of coffee. She had a shaved head with just the smallest amount of peach fuzz 
and a petite but deeply muscled and tanned frame. Her arms were elegantly tattooed in sleeves of flowers. She was dressed in a loose t-shirt that read, I dig digs, and cargo shorts, which showed off a pair of strong, hairy legs. Stephanie? The woman asked. Stevie, she corrected again. Dr. Nell Pixwell, the woman said, extending a hand to each member of the family. Call me Pix. I'm the Minerva faculty housemaster. Stevie chanced a better look at, look at the tiny objects by the tackle box. On closer examination, Stevie realized that these weren't crafting supplies. They were teeth. Lots and lots of loose teeth. Here. On the table. Whether they were real or fake, Stevie didn't know, and she sure wasn't interested. Er, sorry. And she wasn't sure it mattered. A table full of teeth is a table full of teeth. Did you have a good drive? Pix asked, quickly sorting the remaining teeth into compartments. Plink said a tooth, hitting the plastic. Blink. Sorry, I was just sorting a few things out. You're definitely the earliest. Plink, said a molar. Can I get anyone a coffee? The group was herded into the tiny house kitchen, where cups of coffee were distributed, and Pix could explain the eating situation to Stevie's parents. Breakfasts, bre <laughs> breakfasts were provided in-house, and all other meals were in the dining hall. Students could come in and make food whenever they wanted, and there was an online grocery ordering system. As they came back into the common room, Stevie mo Stevie's mother decided to address the obvious. Are those teeth? She asked. Yes, Pick said. No other answer was immediately forthcoming, so Stevie jumped in. Dr. Pixwell is a specialist in bioarchaeology, she said. She works on archaeological digs in Egypt. That's right. Pick said. You read my faculty bio? No, Stevie said. The teeth, your shirt, you got an Eye of Horus tattooed on your wrist. The chamomile tea in the kitchen has packaging written in Arabic, and you have a tan line on your forehead from head covering. Just a guess. That's extremely impressive, Pick said, nodding. Everyone was quiet for a moment. A fly buzzed around Stevie's head. <laughs> Stevie thinks she's Sherlock Holmes, her father said. He liked to make these kinds of remarks that sounded like jokes, and may have been well-intentioned on some level, but always had a hint of shade. Who doesn't want to be Sherlock Holmes? Pick said, meeting his eye and smiling. I read more Agatha Christie when I was younger, because she wrote m about archaeology a lot. But everyone loves Sherlock. Let me show you around. In that moment, with that one remark, Pick's won Stevie's everlasting loyalty. The six students, student rooms of Minerva House were all located on a single hallway to the left side of the common room. Three rooms downstairs, three up. There was a group bathroom on the first floor with tiles that had to be original, because no one would make anything that color anymore. If that shade required a name, Stevie would have to go with Queasy Salmon. At the end of the hall was the turret with a large door. This is a bit special, Pick said, opening it. Minerva was used for the Ellingham's guest before the school was open, so it has some features you don't find in the other dorms. She opened the door and revealed a magnificent round room, a bathroom, with a high ceiling. The floor was tiled in a pearly silver gray. A large clawfoot tub took center stage. There were long stained glass windows depicting stylized flowers and vines that bathed the room in rainbows. This room is popular during exams, Pick said. People like to study in the tub, especially when it's cold. It doesn't get a lot of use otherwise because there is a bit of a spider issue. Now let's show you your room. Stevie decided to ignore what she just heard about spiders and moved on to her room, Minerva 2. Minerva 2 smelled like it had been slowly baking for a few months, thick with the scents of closed space, new paint, and furniture polish. One of the two sash windows facing the front had been opened to try to air it, but the breeze was being lazy. Two flies had come in and were dancing around near the high ceiling. The walls were a soft cream color. A black fireplace stood out in stark contrast. As they moved Stevie's things in, there was talk about where the bed should go. And could people get in that window, and what time was curfew? Pix handled these questions easily. The windows could be open from the top, and all had good locks 
and curfew was 10 on weeknights and 11 on weekends, all monitored electronically through student IDs and by Pix in person. Her mother was about to unpack Stevie's bags herself when Pix intervened and dragged them off on a personal tour of the campus, leaving Stevie with a moment of stillness. The birds chirped outside and the breeze carried a few faraway voices. Minerva, too, made a gentle creak as Stevie walked across its floor. She ran her hands along the walls, feeling their strange texture. They were thick with years of paint, one coat on top of another, covering up the previous inhabitants' marks. Stevie had recently seen a true crime, crime doc- Ugh. Stevie had recently seen a true- Oh my god, I can't read. Stevie had recently seen a true crime documentary on how layers of paint could be peeled back, revealing writing that had been hidden for decades. Since then, she had desperately wanted to steam and peel a wall, just to see if anything was there. These walls probably had stories. Um... Okay, I'll keep going. April 13th, 1936, 6.45 p.m. The fog had come on quickly that day. The morning had blossomed bright and clear, but just after four, a curtain of blue-gray smoke fell over the land. That was the thing so many people would remark about later, the fog. By twilight, everything was wrapped in a pearly dark, and it was difficult to see more than a few feet ahead. The Rolls-Royce Phantom moved through this fog slowly, up the treacherous drive to the Ellingham Estate. It pulled halfway up the circular drive in front of the great house. The car always stopped halfway. Albert Ellingham liked to walk the drive when he got out of the car to survey his mountain kingdom. He stepped out of the back door before the car fully came to a rest. His secretary, Robert McKenzie, waited the extra few seconds to make his exit. You need to go to Philadelphia, Robert said to the back of his employer. No one needs to go to Philadelphia, Robert. You need to go to Philadelphia. We should also spend at least two days at the New York office. The last busload of men working on the final stages of construction pulled past them, heading back to Burlington and the various small towns along the way. It slowed so the passengers could raise their hands to their employer in greeting as they left. Good job today, Albert Ellingham called to them. See you fellows tomorrow. The butler opened the door on their approach, and the two men entered the magnificent entry hall of the house. Every time he entered, Ellingham was pleased with the effect of the place, the way light played around the space, bouncing from every bit of crystal, tinted by a well-spent fortune's worth of Scottish stained glass. "'Evening, Montgomery,' said Ellingham. His booming voice echoed through the open atrium. "'Good evening, sir,' said the butler, accepting the hats and coats. Good evening, Mr. McKenzie. I hope your trip was not too arduous in this fog. Took us forever, Ellingham said. Robert was bending my ear about meetings the entire way. Please tell Mr. Ellingham that he has to go to Philadelphia, Robert said, passing over his hat. Mr. McKenzie wishes me to inform you. I'm starving, Montgomery, Ellingham said. What's on for tonight? Creme de celery soup? and filet of sole with a sauce amadine to start, sir, followed by roast lamb, minted peas, asparagus hollandaise, and potatoes lyonnaise, with a cold lemon souffle to finish. That'll do, as soon as we can. I've worked up an appetite. How many hangers-on do we still have? Miss Robinson and Mr. Nair are still with us, though they have been indisposed most of the day, so I believe it will just be Mrs. Ellingham. Mr. Mackenzie and yourself, sir. Good. Get them. Let's eat. Mrs. Ellingham has not yet returned, sir. She and Miss Alice went out for a drive this afternoon. And they're not back yet? I imagine the fog must have slowed her, sir. Have some men with lights wait at the end of the drive to help her on the path back. Tell her as soon as she gets back it's time to eat. Don't even let her take her coat off. March her right to the table. Very good, sir. Come along, Robert. Robert? Sorry, I'm going <laughs> back and forth. Ellingham said, heading off. We'll go to my office and have a game of Rook. And don't try to argue with me. There's nothing so serious as a game. The secretary was professionally silent in response. 
Playing games with his employer was a non-negotiable part of his job, and there is nothing so serious as a game was one of Ellingham's many mottos. That was why the students always had access to games, and the new Mo Monopoly game was mandatory for students, re residents of the household, and staff. Everyone had to play at least once a week, and there were now monthly tournaments. This was a life. This was life in the world of Albert Ellingham. Robert picked the day's mail out of the tray and sifted through it with a practiced eye, tossing some letters immediately back in the tray and tucking others under his arm. Philadelphia, he said again. It was his job to make sure the great Albert Ellingham stayed on course. Robert was good at this. Fine, fine, schedule it. Uh... Ellingham plucked a Western Union slip from his desk. These tiny slips of paper were his favorite medium for writing short notes. I started a new riddle this morning. Tell me what you think of it. Is the answer Philadelphia? Robert, Ellingham said sternly. My riddle. This is a good one, I think. Now listen. What serves on either side, and if you wish to hide, may protect you from your foe, or show him where to go? Well, what do you think? Robert sighed and paused his mail, sorting to think. Serves on either side he said. Like a spy, a traitor, a duplicitous person. Ellingham smiled and gestured that his secretary should keep thinking. But, Robert said, it's not a who, it's a what. So it's an object that works from two directions. There was a knock at the door, and Ellingham hurried over himself to answer it. It's a door, he said, throwing it open and revealing his ashen-faced butler. A door. Sir, uh, Montgomery said. One moment. You see, Robert, the door can be used from either side. And you can hide behind it, or it might show where you've gone, Robert said. I see. Yes. Sir, uh, Montgomery said. His urgent tone was entirely unfamiliar to the two men, and they looked at him in confusion. What is it, Montgomery? Ellingham said. There's a telephone call, sir. Montgomery replied. You must come at once, sir, on the household line in the pantry. Please, sir, hurry. This was so out of character for Montgomery that Ellingham complied without another word. He followed to the butler's pantry and took the phone that was held out for him. I have your wife and daughter, a voice said. Okay. End of chapter two. I do love to have campfires in the backyard. Thank you for the belated claps. I went camping. People I was with insisted I sleep in the car instead of the tent. <laughs> Hi, Terry. Welcome for joining. I do glamping. <laughs> yes, camping is not for me, which is why I would do a puzzle instead. Do you snore, Terry? Nah, they just didn't want me around in their sleeping area, I guess. Rude, not Dan. Eh, oh well. I feel like pre-made houses groups is a bad idea. Hammocks are fun. We were somewhere once that had three hammocks, and my brother, sister, and I each got on one, and they both fell out of theirs, but I didn't, so that was fun. <laughs> we used to flip the hammock when people were in it. That's awful. Excuse me, it matters what kind of teeth, Stevie. You caught me dun during dinner. I'll have to catch up later. Okay, Shroom. No problem. Thanks for popping in. I'm very hungry myself. I haven't eaten anything, so I might pause stream to get a snack and make some tea. Because my voice is just really rough. Hey, Shane. Good to see you. How are you? <laughs> I don't know that my accent is very good, but I wanted to make the butler kind of posh. So, of course, I made him British. I get the feeling they need to go to Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Oh, thank you for clapping. Tea hype. Oh, I don't have a Be Right Back page. Oops. Okay, well. I will be right back. I'll leave you with some music. And I'll fix this.
Hello, I have returned. I made some <clears throat> tea the English way. I put some almond milk and sugar in it and it's quite tasty. Uh, but it's far away because I have no room on this table to put it. <laughs> um. <clears throat> Thank you for the welcome back. Welcome back to everyone else as well. I'm sorry that took so long. It took long for the water to heat up and then I was eating snack and then I was waiting for the tea to brew so I could put the milk in and I mean I didn't go anywhere. Okay. <laughs> well the tea I chose was papaya passion. It's very good. It's so with all this stuff in it it's like super sweet. So okay to those of you who also do read streams, I don't know if you have this problem, but I feel like my voice is just stuck in the higher registers and won't come down. Like I can't get it to modulate to the deeper end for whatever reason. And so like I'm really frustrated and I don't think my reading is coming off very well. Um, but I'm hoping that the hot tea will help with that. I don't know. Like, I don't know if my vocal cords need to get loosened up or what. Um, or if it's because, like, I haven't talked that much yet today, because, like, I woke up at three, basically. Boo is behind me. <laughs> um, well, thank you for saying it's coming across fine. I've had that issue when doing voice acting in non-voice games. Okay. It's not just me. <clears throat> like some days it's fine and I can adjust pretty well, but I don't know. Except for Greg though, right? Angel Greg was always easy, right? Yeah, and like I'm trying to do guy voices and I just can't. So I don't feel like my voices are very good, and... <clears throat> See if I can grab my tea. It's in my tree cup. Well, I have multiple tree cups, but... Ooh, you can't see the, um... The lines very well. Greg was always a delight. Hi. What you doing? You want to say hi? What is it, baby? Boo -boo. I'm trying to get her to talk. Boo -boo. Yeah. What you doing? She's looking at me like... No, Mom, I'm not going to talk. I know what you're doing. <clears throat> I mean, I could put it here in this very precarious spot. But I just got to be really careful. Boos speaking complete English, yeah. Guy voices as a girl are tough, but I think you're doing fine. Oh, thank you. Okay, well, I want to get a little bit more farther into the book, so <clears throat> I'm going to keep going. And we're going to start on chapter three. So here we go. Chapter three. Stevie Bell had a simple desire. She wanted to be standing over a dead body. She didn't want to kill people. Far from it. She wanted to be the person who found out why the body was dead. That's all. She wanted bags marked evidence and a paper boiler suit like forensics wore. 
She wanted to be in the interrogation room. She wanted to get to the bottom of the case. Which was all well and good, and probably what a lot of people wanted, if only people would be more honest. But her old high school was not the kind of place where she felt like she could fully express this desire. Her old high school was a fine high school, if you liked high school. It wasn't bad or evil. It was just like it was supposed to be. Miles of linoleum and humming lights, the warm funk of cafeteria stink too early in the morning, the flashes of inspiration that were quickly quashed by long stretches of tedium, and the perpetual desire to be somewhere else. <clears throat> and while Stevie had friends there, there was no one who fully understood her love of crime. So she had written a passionate essay, poured it all onto the screen, and sent it away almost as a joke. Ellingham would never take her. Ellingham liked what they saw. They had given her this room. The furniture was wooden and surprisingly big. There was a big dresser that wobbled when Stevie touched it. The polish couldn't cover the many nicks on its surface. Some were just scratches from use, but a few were clear words and initials. Stevie opened the drawers and found, to her surprise, that there were already some, th some things in there. A plaid fan flan a plaid flannel blanket, a heavy purple fleece with the Ellingham Ad Academy crest on the breast, some kind of military-grade flashlight with a new pack of batteries, a blue flannel robe, and some rackets with clamps on them. These Stevie had to remove and examine for a while before she determined that they must be the snowshoes. <coughs> and the pegs she'd seen by the door were likely places to hang them. Stevie had known that she was going to Vermont, and she knew Vermont could get cold, but these items suggested survivalism. She started to opening up her boxes and bags. She pulled out her old gray sheets, the striped comforter that she'd had since she was ten, two of the less yellowed pillows from the closet. As she looked at these objects in the clear Vermont sunlight, they all seemed a bit drab. She had a few new items, like the requisite bath caddy, and flip-flops for trips to the bathroom, but these things didn't exactly liven up the room. <clears throat> but it was fine. In her imagination, her dorm room was going to look like Sherlock Holmes' residence on Baker Street. Shabby, but genteel. She put in her earbuds to finally continue listening to her podcast. This one was about H.H. H. Holmes, the Chicago serial killer. They would discover the many rooms of Holmes's murder castle, the rooms fitted with gas lines, the hanging chamber, the soundproof vault. She'd marked one of her boxes with stars, and she opened this one now. This box contained the bare necessities of her life, her mystery novels, at least a carefully curated selection of a few dozen essentials. These were lovingly arranged on the bookshelf in the order in which she needed to see them. The chute to the furnaces in the basement where the bodies could be. Sherlock Holmes on top with Wilkie Collins, then Agatha Christie spread over two shelves, leading into Josephine Tay and Dor Dorothy L. Sayers. She worked her way down to the modern era and ended with her books on forensics and criminal psychology. She stood back and examined the overall effect, then tweaked until the arrangement was just right. Where her books were, she was. Get the books right and the rest will follow. Now she could address the rest of the room. Acid, a co collection of poisons, a stretching rack. Stevie was less concerned about the day-to-day -day items like her clothes. Stevie had very little interest in clothes, and no money to buy them anyway, so her wardrobe tended to jeans and plain t-shirts. She coveted a heavy fisherman sweater because the detective in her favorite Nordic noir wore one, and preferred a sensible crossbody bag like the one worn by her favor favorite English TV detective. She did have one prized possession in terms of clothes, a vintage red vinyl raincoat straight out of the 1970s, which she had found at the back of her grandmother's closet. It fits Stevie as if it had been made for her, and she decorated it with a selection of tiny lapel pins honoring her favorite bands, podcasts, and books. The coat had deep pockets and a thick belt, and when she was wearing it, Stevie felt powerful, prepared, and extremely waterproof. Even her mother, who disliked Stevie's taste in clothes, was on board for the red raincoat. 
rain red raincoat. Finally, some red. She was hanging the coat in her closet and had just closed the door when she returned. When she turned and saw the zombie. <clears throat> Stevie often read that actors look a little different from the general population because the camera distorts appearances. Someone who looks good on camera looks so good in person that reality starts to bend a bit. This was the case with the figure standing in Stevie's doorway. It was a guy dressed in a white linen shirt and a pair of bright blue shorts looking like a wandering J. Crew ad in search of a glossy spread. <coughs> <coughs> His face was unmistakable. When she had seen it last, it was grim, covered in dirt, frequently crying. Now it was smiling gently. His features were soft and rounded, happy cheeks, a small, playfully rounded nose, a dimpled chin. His brown hair was longish on the top and fell in easy waves. His brows had to be artificially shaped. No arch that, no arch that arched existed in nature. He looked toned all over, but his calves were particularly so. His calves, in fact, had outgrown the rest of him. Beefy calves. Hey, he said. His voice was deep and smooth and rich, like what Gravy might sound like if Gravy could talk. Which, luckily, it cannot. Gravy might have a nice voice, but the conversation would probably be dull. You're Hayes Major, Stevie said. Yeah. He chuckled in a soft, self-deprecating way that Stevie was pretty sure wasn't truly self-deprecating. Hayes was a YouTube star. At the start of the summer, he had released a 10-part online show called The End of It All, about a survivor of a zombie invasion. All of the videos were shot from a basement bunker, just Hayes to the camera, discussing his survival in something called The Hungry City, a beachside town that had a few pockets of human resistance. His show was one of those things that wasn't there one moment and was everywhere the next. Stevie had known Hayes went to Ellingham and that she might see him at some point. She did not expect to see him standing in her doorway as she unpacked. She didn't know he would be in her house. Sorry, I was on the phone, he said. I was talking to some people in LA. He held up his phone as if indicating the presence of tiny Los Angelinos inside of it. It wasn't clear to Stevie why he was apologizing or even explaining why he had been on the phone before she had seen him. But she nodded anyway, like this made sense. Maybe this was something celebrities, Hayes probably counted as an actual celebrity, did. They talked on the phone and then they told you about talking on the phone. So hey, he said, is there any chance you could give me a hand? Stevie blinked in confusion. With what? he asked. My stuff? Oh, Stevie said, feeling the cold hand of panic on her neck. Already she sounded like a slack-jawed idiot. Sure. She followed him to the common room where his bags and boxes, nicer than hers and more of them, were waiting. He gestured to a box. You have to be careful with that one, he said. Stevie took this as a cue to pick that box up. It was a bit on the heavy side, full of some kind of equipment that was unevenly packed and slid around when she moved it. <clears throat> yeah, he said, taking a smaller bag and heading back down the hall to the right circular stairs at the end. It's been a weird summer. That's why I was on the phone. Oh, Stevie said. Yeah, sure. She tried to maneuver the box into the twisting space. The steps creaked loudly and the box caught. Hayes moved ahead, but Stevie was stuck trying to pivot an angle without shaking the box too much. She paused for a moment, expecting Hayes to come back and give her a hand, but when he did not appear, she took a deep breath and persevered, letting the box scrape along the wall. Hayes' room was Minerva 6 at the very end. It was much like hers, but hotter and with an extra window. Oh, great, he said. Set it anywhere. Thanks. Your show is good. She said, I really liked it. This wasn't entirely true. The show was okay at best. In preparation for coming, Stevie had watched all the episodes. They weren't long, maybe 10 minutes each, and they were fine. The story was pretty good. Hayes' acting, less so. 
Most of it was cheekbones and a low, sultry voice. Sometimes that's all that was required. Stevie always tried to be truthful, but she didn't want to make her first acquaintance in her new house and say, Your show was mediocre and overrated, but I see why you're valued for your looks and deep voice. People tended not to warm to that kind of thing. Thanks, he said, <clears throat> leaving the room in a way that suggested she was to come with him and get more stuff. This was good. This was Hayes Major, internet star, talking to her. Also, this was Hayes Major, internet star, getting to her to carry most of the heavy stuff, but still. Another weird thing, Stevie thought, as she made her way back down the twisting steps. She knew about Hayes' love life. Hayes had been involved in a publicized altercation over the summer at some convention when he got involved with another YouTuber named Beth Brave, star of a show called Beth Isn't Here. Beth had been dating Lars Jackson from a show called These Guys. Some kind of argument broke out when Hayes got together with Beth that had been widely recorded and the three of them had a screaming fight in the hallway. There was online chatter after speculating that Beth would be involved in a second season of The End of It All. This was the kind of life Hayes led. It was very different from Stevie's life. People in LA, he said unprovoked as they picked up some more boxes. There's been a lot of interest in the show for movies, so... He let that hang in the air until Stevie said, Wow. Yeah, he said. My agent wants me to make another show series right away because there's a lot of interest right now. Another trudge up the tri tight steps. More zombies? Stevie asked as she caught her breath. Um, I don't know. You can just put that on the bed. I mean, I did that already. You turned into one at the end, Stevie said. I think. It was kind of open-ended. Yeah, he said, and his tone indicated that he was no longer really warming to the conversation. So, I, I just have to make a few more calls now that I'm here. Thanks a lot. I'll see you around. Yep, Stevie said, wiping the sweat from her brow as she backed out of the room. I'll see you, you know, here. He was already dialing. As she stepped out into the hall and went down the stairs, two things occurred to Stevie. The first was that it was eight in the morning here, so five in the morning in LA, on a weekend. While they may keep strange hours in Hollywood, it seemed unlikely that Hayes was doing a bunch of important business at that time. The second was that, even though he lived in the same building as she did, Hayes Major had never asked her name. <clears throat> April 13th, 1936, 7.15pm. We have your wife and daughter. Do exactly as we say if you want them to live. Do not call the police. We will know if you have. We have eyes on the police station. Take 25000 out of the safe. Come out to the lake yourself. Get into a boat with the money and come to the island. You have 15 minutes. The line went dead. Three men stood in the butler's pantry. Albert Ellingham had the telephone. Robert McKenzie and Montgomery, the butler, stood at the door. Albert Ellingham replaced the receiver on the hook and thick, frantic quiet followed. Montgomery... Ellingham said quietly. Have Miss Pelham secure the children at the school. Everyone back in their houses. Doors locked. Curtains drawn. Everyone is to go inside. Do this now. Robert with me. Robert McKenzie again trailed his fast-moving employer to his office. Once inside, Ellingham shut and locked the door, then went to the French doors and looked outside. The dark had come over, had come down over the mountains. The dark had come down everywhere. Ellingham marched to one of the bookcases in the windowless wall. He pulled down a book from a top shelf, but just halfway. There was a telltale snick, and the entire panel of wall gave. Ellingham swung back the bookcase, revealing a massive vault inside of the wall. He entered the combination and turned the lock. Robert, meanwhile, ran from window to window, pulling the curtains. We have to call the police, Robert said. We have to call them now. Find a lamp and light it for me, Ellingham said, pulling out several bags of cash. 
There are still a few workmen on the property. Robert persisted, pulling the massive curtains that swept over the wall of French doors at the back of the room. We could have them out in five minutes, surrounding the property and out on the roads. Some of them have shotguns. All of them are handy enough. Robert, there's no time for this. I'm taking this money out to the lake. Light a lamp and then help me count. Later, when asked about this moment, Robert McKenzie would say that there really was no time to think. That was the genius of the demand. No time to think. No time to plan. He grabbed one of the oil lamps kept in every room of the house. Power loss was frequent. Lit it and then dropped to his knees and started to count money. In the end, there was 23,000 and a few extra 20s. It's not enough. We need more. For one of the first times in his life, Albert Ellingham sounded desperate. I only have five more minutes to get this outside. We need something. One of America's richest men raced around his office for a moment, pulling open drawers, looking for piles of cash he certainly didn't have, or anything that might be worth that much money. It will have to do, he said. The bag of cash only weighed maybe 20 pounds. Ellingham hoisted it and opened the French doors. Robert paused before handing in the oil lamp. You know they can take you out there. It's probably you they want. Then they'll have me. And then what? Robert said. This is madness. We need help. Albert Ellingham took a crucial second's pause. Marsh, he said. Call him at home. Don't say what's happened. Just get him up here on some pretense. No one else. Do you understand? No one but Marsh. Robert nodded. Albert Ellingham took the lamp and stepped out into the Vermont mountain fog carrying a bag of money. He walked the fifty or so yards to the lake edge where there was a small dock. He set the money into one of the rowboats he had moored on the side facing the house and got inside carefully, then put the lamp on the empty bench seat. Hi boo, you're interrupting. <laughs> when he knocked the edge of land away with his oar, his entire body was shaking. Still, he reached the mound in a minute or two and threw the rope around the mooring post. I'm here, he called into the dark. A flashlight shone down on him, blinding him for a moment. Get out, said a voice. Bring the money. My wife and daughter, where are they? Stop talking. Ellingham threw the bag. It landed on the narrow strip of grass around the dome. He got out as well as he could, considering that he could barely see. The person kept the light squarely on Ellingham's face, forcing him to look down and shield his eyes. He half crawled out of the boat onto the ground. Open the door, the voice said. Ellingham pulled his keys from his pocket and opened the door on the side of the dome. This dome was his little thinking place, his island of peace. The person shoved him hard, pushing him into the dome where he landed on the floor. Put the money in the hatch, the voice said. The person was speaking through a scarf, so it was muffled. There was an accent there, an accent he was trying to hide by pulling out the words in a strange way. His pupils were still constricted from the light, so Ellingham felt blindly along the floor, floor, feeling for the hatch. He found it and opened it and pushed the sack into the hole. He heard it knocking some bottles off the shelves as it fell, and they shattered on the floor. He turned back to the stranger, but the light was showed shoved right back into his face, blinding him again. Ellingham battled with himself for a moment. Should he lunge for this person? Just take him down now, beat his head into the side of the stone base of the observatory floor, and demand with every blow where his family was? Fear and rage came in equal measure, but Ellingham had not gone as far as he had in life by giving in to every impulse. It's everything I had in the safe, he said. I was under 2,000 short, but we gave you whatever we had. If I'd had more time, you can have whatever you want. Anything you want. Something came down on his head, and then all faded to black. End of chapter 3. Beefy calves, J. Crew had outgrown the rest of him. That might need to be checked out. What? You don't make friends by being bluntly honest? I know, right? French doors really speak to me. They aren't quite the aesthetic. 
<laughs> yeah, Barry Nancy Drew fades to black, right? Welcome for clapping. Thank you for clapping. I think I'll, I'll at least do one more chapter. I'm not sure how long it is. Also, this at uh, this music I feel like is not. Oh, it's not very long. Um, this music isn't really atmospheric for the book, but it stays black for a minute. Thank you for clapping. Um, I love this book so much. Like I'm, I love like I'm reading it for the second time, right? After just reading it not that long ago. It's so good! Like, I'm just as into it the second time. And now that I know, like, w what all happens, I'm catching up on stuff that I missed the first time. So, I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I do. I, I don't know why, this just, like, became a very quick obsession with for me. And what's funny is that I read this book for class. Like, we got to pick out the book, but it was for my YA class. And, uh, my voice has gotten worse. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can tell. Um, but, uh, the, the genre is mystery. And I'd been wanting to read this, like, my coworker suggested it to me. And so I read it and I was like, have to read the rest immediately. <laughs> so I think I read the whole series and two or three weeks. Maybe before the next stream I can find some more um, atmospheric music. This tea is great though. <clears throat> CJ, what polar bear water did you have? There's nothing stopping you from still being a reader. I used to read, like, mad when I was a kid. And, you know, like, Kean, um, he does audiobooks now. So, like, you do whatever works for you. If you, if you like audiobooks, if you like listening to read streams, ooh, orange vanilla, ooh, very nice. Um, <clears throat> if you like, uh, doing ebooks, or if you prefer a physical book in your hand, which is why I bought these books for this stream, because reading a, a book on stream on your phone just mm, uh, rubbed me wrong. And I want the books anyways, so I just use it as an excuse to get it. Hi, Riddy! Thank you for the claps. I hope you're doing well. Thank you for being here. Yeah, I wish I had time to read things not related to school. Exactly. Exactly. Which was, like, a cool part of my YA class, is, like, I got to read books that I enjoyed, and I got to pick- Thank you for the host, by the way. I'm sorry I don't have alerts on, but, um, because I'm on a different computer. But, um, what am I saying? But it's still school, you know? And I, I did get a lot out of the class, like, on reflection. I did enjoy it, and, um, it was a good class, but taking it at the same time as my organization class was rough, because it was just too much reading, too much work, all at once. Okay, um, I'm gonna go in with chapter four. So here we go. Chapter 4. After making such a huge impression on Hayes Major, Stevie paced her room for a few moments and reviewed her introductory strategy. More confidence. That's what she needed. When she joined the FBI, she was going to need to walk up to people and shake their hands, look them in the eye, ask questions. Hayes had just caught her by surprise. Her next chance was already here, kicking a laundry basket brimming with sketchbooks, pencils, oil crayons, and paints sitting by the door. A girl, the presumed owner of the foot, followed it in. 
She wore a faded shrunken yellow t-shirt from an auto repair shop and an old cheerleading skirt in deep blue with red internal pleats. Her legs were covered with little bruises and nicks. Nothing serious looking, more like the kind you would get by trying, trying to climb trees or other objects. Her feet were just about covered in a pair of scruffy red cloth Mary Jane slippers, held together with safety pins. Her hair was the real statement piece. <clears throat> it looked unwashed and matted, and it had been gathered in little bunches around her head and tied into bundles with what looked like baby socks. Down her left arm was a long tattoo, one massive line of elaborate script. Down her right arm were notes and sketches in different colors of pen. It's hot as balls in here, the girl said and greeted, greeting. Balls, seriously. When the hell are they going to get some AC? Stevie stepped forward, considering offering a hand for a handshake, and opted instead for a casual lean against one of the chairs. I'm Stevie, she said. Stevie Bell. What's up? The girl said. I'm Ellie. There was no Ellie on the list of Ellingham students, but there was an Element Walker. And this person looked like an element. Ellie, or Element, kicked a box that contained feathered boas, a ukulele, a bowler hat, and a lot of plastic storage bags full of used makeup, and spilled glitter across the floor. Can I help? Stevie said. Ellie shrugged, but seemed happy enough with the offer. Ellie's things were a lot scrappier than Hayes's or Stevie's. Two old cardboard boxes, an oversized army duffel bag, a gold backpack, and a lump in black laundry sack. It didn't take long to deposit these items in Minerva 3, which was down by the turreted bathroom. Picks! Ellie yelled as she dragged the last of her things into her room, then walked back to the common area. Why is it hot as balls in here? Note to self, Stevie thought. You could say balls to teachers here. It's summer, Picks replied, coming into the common room. Hey, Stevie. Why, are, why is there French in the background? <laughs> hey, Stevie, I left your parents out on the tour. They'll be back soon. And Ellie, the heat won't last long, and then you'll be freezing. So you can look forward to that. Why don't they get air conditioning? Ellie said, dropping heavily into the hammock chair. She spun around and turned herself upside down, letting her head hang off the bottom, dusting the floor with her hair bunches. Because this is an old building with old wiring, Pix replied. Because fire. How is Paris? Hot, Ellie said. We went to Nice for a while. Is that how you say that? My mom has a new boyfriend and he has a place there. Paris. Ellie had been in Paris. Obviously, Stevie knew that Paris was a real place that re real people went to. Her school sponsored a French club trip the last summer, and she knew three people who had gone on it. It was only a week long, and the biggest story out of it was that Toby Davidson got hit by a bike and almost lost a finger. Almost lost a finger, the Toby Davidson story. Not a compelling read. There were shuffling noises by the door, and Stevie turned to see another person there. Well, come here. Okay, bye. Though it was blazingly sunny, he had the look of someone caught in a rainstorm with a heavy backpack on. He wore a t-shirt that said, If you can read this shirt, you are too close. His eyes were a strange pale gray. He had a shock of red blonde hair that had been cut by someone with more enthusiasm than skill. Nate! She said. Out with a hand, meet his eye. I'm Stevie. Nate looked at her outstretched hand and then at Stevie's face, seemingly to check if this was a serious gesture. With a sigh that probably, probably, wasn't supposed to be audible, he shook it once and let it go quickly. Stevie decided to drop the handshake move. Pix greeted Nate and got out his key, while Ellie examined him from her upside-down position. Nate's a writer, Stevie offered. He wrote a book, The Moonbright Chronicles. Never read it. Ellie replied. But that's cool. What about you? I read it, Stevie said. <laughs> no, Ellie said. You. What do you do? Oh, right, Stevie said, brushing away her mistake. She borrowed her technique from one of her current favorite TV detectives, Sam Weatherfeld of Stormy Weather. Sam never got stuck on moments like that. 
She always moved with the flow of conversation and didn't try to walk against the current. It was time to declare her for herself for what she was. She had considered many terms. It was too presumptuous and silly to say detective. She wasn't any kind of law officer or private investigator, and she had never really solved a case. Crime buff just sounded like a weird hobbyist with a high gloss. Crime historian wasn't quite right and was definitely too dull. Her solution was not to give herself a title, but to state an activity. I study crime, she said. To do it or stop it? Ellie said. To stop it, Stevie said. But it probably works either way. So you came here because of the crimes? Ellie said. The murders? Kind of, Stevie said. That's cool. Someone should. They're good murders, right? She did half a backward somersault out of the chair. Her skirt stuck, stuck up in the back, revealing her butt. Ellie had simply accepted her, just like that. For a moment, it was all endorphins and rainbows in Stevie's head. That was all it had taken, one nice, accepting word from another student, and she realized it would all be okay. And yes, they were good murders. Hold on. Then she caught something in her peripheral vision. Her parents were coming down the path with another pair of parents, most likely Nate's. Nate's parents were very angular people, crisply dressed in near-matching polo shirts and long shorts. The colors were different, but the effect was the same. Stevie's dad was talking and gesticulating, and her mom was nodding. Nate's father was listening, and his mother was scanning the house in the middle distance. The endorphins fled the scene and replaced, were replaced by cold sweat. What were her parents saying? Were they talking about their views on the media? That the government was trying to co control the lives of decent Americans? The myths of climate change? Or was it something more fun, like the price of bulk toilet paper? These were all favorite topics, and all equal possibilities. Stevie looked to Nate, who was staring at the door like he was watching an approaching cloud of locusts. He was also feeling the strain of parents meeting parents. Ellie was now scratching her exposed butt. Well, not the butt butt, but the upper leg part where it meets the butt zone. Technically thigh, but butt for all legal intents and purposes. Stevie gripped the chair and braced for impact. Did you see a moose? She said to Nate in an attempt to make some kind of conversation. What? He said, which was fair enough. All of the parents arrived at the door in a knot and trickled through the common room. Just avoiding the toll roads, Stevie heard her dad say. The conversation had been about the trip, most likely. That was probably very dull, but safe. Then eight parental eyes turned to the exposed butt on the floor. Ellie rolled into a seated position just a few seconds too late. Her matted, baby-socked hair stood on end for a moment. Nate's parents showed no outward sign, but Stevie saw her parents take it in. Her father looked away. Her mom's mouth twisted into a small, confused grin. Let me show you what I did to my room, she said, hooking one parent by each arm and hustling them down the hall. What in God's name was that girl wearing? Her mother asked a little too loudly as Stevie shut the door of her room behind them. I've never seen anything like that get up before. Her dad added. Stevie's parents labored under the belief that w when a person was wearing, what a person was wearing had a direct correlation to their worth as a human being. There were normal clothes, good, and there were nice clothes, very good, and there was everything else. Ellie had just reset the limits on this last category. Did you like the campus? Stevie said, smiling. Isn't it amazing? That the campus was amazing was undeniable, and her parents made a clear effort not to dwell on Ellie, and instead focus on this mountain paradise of mansions and fountains and art and natural beauty. We're gonna have to head back soon, her dad said. Are you set? On that, Stevie had an entirely unexpected emotional pang. Her parents were about to leave, which was something she had known about and frankly wanted, but now in the moment, there was a hot rush of feeling. She gulped hard. Okay, her mother said. You have your pills? Let's just put eyes on the pills. Stevie's plastic bag of medications was produced and examined. 
You have 120 Lexapro and 30 Ativan, but only take the Ativan if you need it. I know, but if you need it, make sure- Mom, I know. I know you know, and you call us every day. You'll be good, her dad said, hugging her hard. You need us, you call. Doesn't matter the time. Her father looked genuinely on the verge of tears. This was the worst. Bells did not cry. Bells did not show feeling. This had to stop. Remember, her mother said into her ear, you can always come home. We'll come up and get you. Her mother's final little squeeze said, this isn't the kind of place you belong. You'll see. You'll be back. Okay, that was the end of chapter four. Which finger, though? What? I'm assuming the what was to the French in the background. It was part of the music. Rudy and Anna studying crime to do it. I mean, all the good murders. You're on your last roll of toilet paper. Um. Yeah, order toilet paper ASAP. Yeah, it was part of the music. <laughs> it wasn't like me suddenly speaking French, because you know I can't speak French. <laughs> I don't know, it seems like they only have massive packages or otherwise they're out of stock. I'd say get the massive package and then you don't have to worry about ordering another thing again. Yeah, I'd say go ahead and order. Because I wouldn't want to wait too long. Yeah, I think I'm going to call it there. We're 60 pages in. And Boo is whining at me. And it's been two and a half hours, and my voice is struggling, so... But I am planning on streaming tomorrow. Um, let me see what time. Okay, so same time tomorrow, which... <laughs> um, since I have everything set up, I should be good to go and start stream at 3 p.m. Central tomorrow. And then, um... Let's see, it looks like V is streaming in the morning. Oh, I think she's doing a read stream, maybe? And then CJ will be streaming after me. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed the beginning. Um, I will work on getting the YouTube video up. So in case you missed anything, you can watch. Um, and I will put the tags in the, the timestamps in the description for everybody on YouTube. Um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it so far, and I will continue the story tomorrow. Truly Devious by Maureen Johnson. Um, I think that's everything, and I'm gonna go eat some dinner. So, I'll see you guys later. Bye.